there we go. Thank you, everybody, for um, and thank you, Telecare, for inviting me to do this section. Um, I'm going to introduce the two speakers. I do apologize for the, uh, my name there, which says Rotary Mount Martha. I'm on the right Mount Martha board, but I'm not able to change that name. So it is Carol. <laughs> um, so the two speakers that we're going to have this afternoon are First of all, Sanjin Patel, and Sanjin is a, a general practitioner and founder of the Aged Care GPs group. He's a keen innovator in the provision of primary care to older people living in aged care, and he's passionate about helping GPs discover that the fulfillment that working with residents in aged care can bring. So, San Sachin is the first speaker. The second speaker is Jared Mansour. Jared is the Commissioner of Senior Victorians and Ambassador for Elder Abuse Prevention. Jared, who I've known for over 20 years, is a highly respected and passionate advocate for the needs of older people. Uh, Gerard, do you want to start off? Should we get you started? I think we yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Session. Um, technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? So, yeah, look, um, I was appointed uh, seven years ago now as um, uh, the first ever commissioner for senior Victorians. And um, the key focus of my role is the longer term issues of what's happening to older people. And um, I work through and report to government through Minister Luke Donnellan. But obviously, a lot of my work takes me across a huge range of government portfolios. And at any one time, I can be providing advice and, and input on a whole range of issues. But in addition to responding to a whole range of policy areas that government is initiating, in my discussions um, and uh, regular planning with Minister Luke Donnellan, I pick the areas where I consider there are some very important, um, significant issues for older people themselves to deal with, and I take the lead on those. And one of those areas is um, what I'd like to share with you uh, with you this morning, and it's about um, the ability of older people to age well. Um, and I should have said at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge um, the um, our Aboriginal elders uh, and the different lands that we're meeting on today. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I know we're from all different lands, and I'd like to add, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and so I'd like to share with you some insights that I've received uh, from a report that I published in November last year. Uh, it was released by government, and it's called Aging Well in a Changing World. And I'd like you to, to take you through a couple of key things um, that relate to the, the whole critical issue of digital access and, and telecommunications from an older person's perspective. But um, over recent months, I've been out communicating again with older people and refreshing my understanding about how the whole experience of COVID and communication and access to the medical system and the health system has occurred in the last few months. And I'd, I'd like to make some observations about that as well. So I'll share my screen now and um, take you through a few of the, the key issues that came up in the report and then make some observations about telehealth. And at the end, um, there will be, for those of you that are interested in reading the full report, and there's also a summary report, um, there'll be a link to that that we can pop into the chat a bit later. So the first thing is that um, in, in doing a report about what it means to age well, uh, I was very keen to do two things, and we had a two-part methodology. Part of it was an online survey, and we got nearly 5,000 responses, which is one of the largest cohorts that we've had of th this sort of research anywhere in Australia. Um, and even on the, I must say, even on the world stage, it's a very significant sample size. And so, you know, like any online survey has a bias, um, and that's always going to be the case. Uh, and it'll particularly bias, of course, towards people who are more digitally literate. Interestingly, in terms of the, the people who responded, the, the dominant cohort are people between ages 60 and 80. So there's a very small representation of people that are over 80 years of age. In terms of what the survey told us, um, uh, the, the good news is that the majority of older people think that they're doing pretty well when it comes to the issue of their, their ageing and their ageing journey. They've got a pretty good understanding of the things that, that they consider are particularly important. 
But um, as this slide shows us, there's what I'd call a, a soft underbelly that we really need to be aware of um, from a health and a, and a wellbeing perspective. Uh, and that's that 42% of older people can only think about the future with a lot or some concern. And bear in mind, my research was undertaken pre-COVID. So I think if we did this, you know, this sort of questioning again, we would see an increase in some of these measures. 41% um, feel lonely often or some of the time. And I'd like to, to make a couple of early observations about that. I think that this very much validates my earlier report in 2016 about the impact of isolation and loneliness of older people. I think it is um, a growing issue. I'm very pleased that our own State Mental Health Royal Commission acknowledged the significance of this issue going forward um, for, for a significant portion of people in our population. And it would seem from the research that the, the two biggest groups impacted by isolation and loneliness are people over 60 years of age and people in, um, in the 19 to 25 category. So there's a, there's a real intergenerational impact on, on the issue of isolation and loneliness. And then you get to, I think, to one of the most telling points of the survey, that roughly one in five people who responded have none or little or the love of the friendship that they want, none or little of the enjoyment and pleasure that they want, and none or little of the things that um, make them feel valued in society. And as I mentioned earlier, there's only a very small proportion who aren't able to be independent at all. So what it tells us is whilst the majority of people are tracking pretty well in terms of the journey of growing older and what it means to age well, uh, around about one in five uh, um, have some significant issues that impact. And um, the second part of my research was to, to build a profile of how older people themselves saw the journey and the attributes of aging well. And this was really the key part of my research and the key part of my report, to see what older people themselves are the combined set of attributes uh, of aging well. And there are eight, as you can see on the screen here, uh, having a positive attitude, that their life has purpose and meaning, that they are both respected and give respect, that they're connected to family, friends and society, that they're in touch with a changing world. And that's the, the key one I'm gonna, going to talk about today, that they have a sense of safety and security at home and financially, bearing in mind that a, a significant number of people over 65 are full pensioners. So, so financial security and security and safety generally are significant issues for many older people being able to manage their health issues, including mental health and able to get around. So before I go on to, um, to talk primarily about um, today in touch with the changing world, there's a couple of just high level comments I'd like to make. The first is from a, a really significantly positive point of view, older people are particularly interested in, in attribute number seven, the ability to self-manage their health is a very uh, important issue from an older person's perspective. And I'm sure um, as GPs and health professionals, you would see this all the time. So having the right knowledge and information that's available to them to be able to um, do the best they can in managing their health is a really important issue from an older person's perspective. From a challenges perspective, Two of the most significant issues that came up in my research is the impact of ageism from a systemic point of view. So older people gave me many examples from their life and their life journey where they feel society itself doesn't value older people in the same way as it values other people in our society. So the issue of ageism and structural discrimination is an issue that's very much on the minds of many older people. The other is the, 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 question, the question that's sort of related to it, but it's a tied question about what I'd call invisibility. So many older people, when they shared their story of growing older said that somehow, and for some reason, they become invisible in so many ways to our community whether it's in profiles in the media, whether it's the images that are presented, whether it's them standing in a retail shop and, and being served. Their sense is that um, there's, a, there's a real view of the older they get, the more invisible they come, uh, become to their community. And so um, for those of you that are, that are interested in understanding a little bit more about that, um, you're welcome to um, follow through and have a look at my report. 
So today, I'm keen to, uh, in the light of today's topic, talk about one of the most important issues from an older person's perspective, and it's staying in touch with the changing world. And here's one of the quotes that, are, that I've put up from uh, an older person's perspective that captures the spirit of what many older people had to say. The challenge of change and resistance to change, we need to work together to help people better understand what it means to grow older, to be assisted through change and be less fearful. And it's not just about a narrow approach to technology. It's, it's a much broader approach about how people access information. If you could uh, you know, imagine that the, the significant number of older people that, that don't draw their news from online platforms, they still rely on radio and other and newspapers as a, as a key source of information. And so keeping up to date with information becomes a significant issue. Even, um, and for those of you that get a chance to listen to Talkback Radio, you'll often hear older people ring in and say, oh, we don't know where the sites are of COVID risk at the moment because we're not able to access the internet. So um, accessing information in a timely manner <clears throat> is increasingly significant for the po those people that aren't engaged with the online world. Adapting to change, digital communication does in many ways provide opportunities. And this was one of the really the positive things that came out of my report. There's a significant number of older people in what I, what I sort of see as a middle cohort who with the right training and support and assistance can certainly engage much more on the digital world. And, and I see that there's sort of three groups. There's a, there's a group of older people that are and have been early adopters. And if you talk to them about the fact that our oh, older people don't know how to work technology, they'll push back very significantly. And they'll, <clears throat> they may have been people that have been involved in technology for a significant part of their professional life. They're on Facebook, they follow news um, in a whole range of online platforms, they read their newspaper online. So there are certainly a group of older people that are very digitally enabled and very digitally savvy and they communicate with their children and grandchildren through a whole range of online platforms. There's a group in the middle and I, I think this is the biggest cohort who have some capacity but they would like to know more. And what they consistently say to me is when they have the right training opportunities and the right support, they can grow and they can grow significantly, but they continue to need refreshing and support as things change over time. And there's a third cohort, and the third cohort are the people for whom on the online world is probably always going to be a step too far. And for them, it's going to rely on other platforms of providing information and accessing services. And particularly the two areas that they'll focus on are the telephone, that they can actually talk to somebody or face to face. Uh, and so when we think about you know, the continuum, uh, that's, that's the sort of the, the, the way older people share and talk about their views with me. In terms of the risk and barriers, um, there's a whole range of them that, um, that I can point out. One of the most important ones is the second bullet point I've got there is online technology platforms are not always fit for purpose. For those of you that um, um, are, say closer to the aged care system, and you move on to say the My Age Care website, what lots of older people will tell me that they're okay when they get to the front page of something like that. But as soon as they start to try to navigate through complex websites to get access to information, they get lost very, very quickly. The cost of maintaining and updating systems and hardware and internet for older people can be a very significant issue, bearing in mind more than half of people aged over 65 are full pensioners. So cost is always going to be a major issue for a substantial number of older people. Um, and so there'll always be the need for alternatives to online platforms. And so what are the more recent things that older people are talking about? Uh, and so over the last few months in the light of the whole COVID experience, I've been out and about trying to get an understanding and get my finger back on the pulse of, about how older people perceive the move in a very significant way on, onto online and digital platforms. And I've heard a number of speakers over the last month to talk about that we've almost jumped five or 10 years in development and progress over this period of time. Um, and so the, you know, the start with the positives. There are many older people that over the last year for the first time have learned how to use Zoom. Uh, and they see an enormous value proposition and been able to eliminate travel time. People that say, for example, that are older and have he hearing challenges can much more easily participate in online platforms like Zoom. 
Um, it's also been a confidence builder for them. So a lot of people that were interested in doing this with the support of organisations like local government, University of the Third Age, Men's Sheds, Enabled Houses. So many organisations have been investing in a micro area in helping older people better engage with technology. And there, <clears throat> there are some wonderfully positive stories that have come out of that. <clears throat> many older people still want to increase their skills. Um, and with support, um, they can embrace technology. And then you get to the challenges, and there are so many that so much of our access to frontline services and support is now through an online platform. There's a real fear for many older people about technology, of scams and the safety of using technology. Uh, there's always the, the challenge of keeping up to date with information, and COVID is a great example of that. The issue of cost that I've mentioned, and the lack of availability to, to alternate platforms that, that older people so often want. So that's just a quick snapshot, Carol, and, and session of the, a whole range of things that I've identified from an older person's perspective. And thanks for the opportunity to be part of today's panel. You're back on mute again, Carol. I've got a dog that worries me. Um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, and I apologise for my phone ringing in the middle of that, but I can see, Jared, you took over very well, so that was great. Sashin, can I introduce you now? And for, for you to start with, by just giving us an idea of some of the issues that you identified and had to deal with during the COVID lockdowns that we experienced. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, uh, I'd love to just start... Um, uh, with you know we keep everyone awake in the audience um, uh, just uh, type where you are in the country for us just type that in the in the in the chat for us um, while we're getting going yeah so the way I thought I would talk about this today is um, probably what happened early on with the at the beginning of the pandemic then what happened in the middle you know the the uh, interesting time we had with uh, many months of lockdown and then obviously where where I see that we're at at the moment excellent so we've got a good spread along the, along the country. I want to see if we can get someone from every state to, to respond. Um, as I go through this, I'd love to, uh, with any of the attendees, um, uh, just put a, you know, a yes or something, if, if something I'm saying rings true with you or your experiences, because it's just good to know if the, for others whether the experiences I'm sharing are actually commonplace or just in my little uh, bubble. So um, early on in the pandemic, so now we're we're talking, you know, February, which was actually before the pandemic was declared. We all knew it was a pandemic, um, but no one was calling it a pandemic. Um, uh, there was a, an incident that happened that we'll refer to later when we talk about vaccines, but um, at Kirkland Life Care in the United States, 120 residents in February last year got COVID, and of those, 39 perished. So pretty reliable 33%. Um, uh, you know, calculation of, of people that, that perished. And so um, with that learning, we knew early on that it was likely that if that made it, if it made its way into aged care in um, Australia, that we, we may see similar results. So um, as an organisation at that time, we were communicating, the doctors in our team were, you know, starting to wear PPE. Um, and we saw a real um, variety of response and, and it fell into two broad categories. One was um, of people who embraced the risk and uh, took precautions, but there was another whole group where um, in aged care, there seemed to be you know, some real complacency, um, uh, potentially poor leadership at higher, higher levels, um, uh, which then fed down onto the shop floor that, oh, this is nothing to worry about. It's just flu. Don't worry about it. Please don't wear PPE. It makes us look bad. Um, those type of things. And so um, the other thing that came along early on in the pandemic was a sense of shame. So there was a case of the doctor who got COVID off, you know, whilst returning from the US. And that doctor was publicly, you know, shamed. Um, uh, you know, the flabbergasted situation last year you know that's just completely unhelpful because it it shuts off people from actually doing the appropriate thing and then facilities where covid had innocently made its way in early on we were involved in the first outbreak in aged care in melbourne um, uh, you know they felt a sense of shame and there was a real 
sense of disorganization about who is doing what and how things would progress. And that's understandable. It's the beginning of, of this whole um, uh, journey that we've had. And so at that stage, it was literally each to their own. Um, in this case, you know, the GP and support from our group, we, um, you know, it was tireless. It was tireless. Um, uh, you know, the, the effort that had to go into it, it was never ending. Um, and in that situation, um, we restricted it with a combination of the facility and the, that particular doctor's efforts to, to two residents, and it never spread beyond that, even though they were cared for on site with the appropriate measures in place. And that was a really good success story early on. And so um, then, you know, the numbers started to creep down around June and everyone was, uh, you know, opening up, let's open up, let's open up. And at that point, our message to facilities was, the numbers might start, like, start to look like they're going down. This is your time to double down, to go extra careful, be extra mindful of what you're doing. And there was a sense, probably with public messaging about wanting to open up, which is understandable. It was a new experience for all of us last June. Um, uh, again, we probably all got a bit complacent. And so then July hit and we, you know, we don't need to revisit what happened between uh, July and um, November, but you know, the reality was that it spread like wildfire throughout facilities in, in Melbourne in particular. And um, uh, there was a real sense of panic because, because of the rules around um, isolation requirements, et cetera, you had whole situations where entire facility care teams had to isolate. And so um, where things started to fall down wasn't actually even medical care, it was personal care attention um, and, and those um, really what seem simple, but it's actually simple, which is the most important, right? It's those very basics that started to fail. And so drastic measures had to happen. Um, and they did. There was the aged care response center that was set up. Um, uh, there were people flown in from all over the country to try, try and assist. But the difficulty was are all around communication. There wasn't any good communication going on. So residents were being... Uh, residents who became patients with COVID were being moved all over the place without clear communication. Everyone was trying their best, um, but the reality was there was a disconnect between those making the decisions and the reality on the shop floor. And so you had care teams coming into facilities who literally didn't, they couldn't identify who the patients were to give them their medications. It was as, as, as simple as that. From a general practice perspective, there's very little communication. So what happened in Melbourne is um, we set up um, a group of us set up online um, Zooms every week. We had people from the um, Aged Care Response Centre coming in um, and uh, we just made up our own thing to try and keep communication open because there was no proper communication. And the people who wanted to get communication happening were saying, we'll do it next month, like four weeks away. But the reality was we needed it now. Um, so that was a, a lesson. And, and probably the biggest thing that I saw is that the people who had the most local knowledge were not involved. And, and that was probably one of the biggest mistakes, I'd say, which was um, especially general, general practitioners. Karen alluded to it in the last um, conversation. Since then, um, things have definitely got more strict um, and there is better leadership um, and there's some you know, really good, good results and there's some clear pathways now when there is an outbreak that, that are much more defined. Um, uh, and that was, you know, evident with the recent outbreak that happened in Melbourne, uh, really well managed, really great communication in all of this. The most important thing is communication. So um, keeping families up to date. People don't like it when they're trying to contact and there's a black hole because our mind catastrophizes and we're thinking about the worst case scenario. In that middle time with the you know, second lockdown we had here in Melbourne, July onwards with the big outbreaks, we just took to organizing the doctors in our team, organized Zooms with entire facility family groups just to keep them informed because there's no one else doing it. Now those measures are happening and that's great because often one of the biggest um, bugbears for people is just not knowing. People can cope with anything if they know. Um, I think the biggest problem I now see is around fatigue. So staff in aged care have really been battered um, over the last 18 months or so. There's the Royal Commission and, um, you know, this never-ending uh, pandemic 
And I think there's just a real sense of fatigue and um, they've just taken a lot of punches. And I think it's really important for any of us who work in aged care just to, you know, we all have frustrations in our day-to-day -day work, but we've got to really remember that these people have been in a, through some really tough times and haven't really been given any thanks at all in aged care. They've only been told what they're doing wrong. But let's remember, we've actually done incredibly well, incredibly well as a nation. Uh, even in Melbourne, which had a massive outbreak, we've actually done really, really well when you put it in context with what's happening elsewhere. In the UK, in the US, one in 10 people who live in long-term care have died. Mm. One in 10 people in long-term care have died in the UK and the US. So I think it's just really important, whilst we must do better, we always want to strive for better. We've got to remember how well we have actually done. And that's my message. And I just want to say thank you to each and every person who works in aged care. You've, you've done an incredible job through really tough times. Could we have done all be all of us done better? Yes. But just never forget how much effort and thanks we all do have for you. Maybe we don't verbalise it as much as we should. Um, um, and I just end with, yeah, just one last thing, which is, I think, if there's one message I can give is that GPs, the primary care physician, must not be sidelined. You know, there's two GPs are caught in the middle between state and federal and are just left. Um, and that's the biggest mistake that they keep making. And they've done it again with vaccination. They left GPs out. And, you know, that if you don't solve that mistake, uh, a problem of a different type will keep happening. Thanks, Sanjan. That's really very interesting from that perspective. Uh, from my perspective as a board member, one of the things I did was I actually sat down in, I think it was July, August of last year and phoned every single resident that we would looked after at our aged care in Hastings. And uh, people were so grateful just to hear a voice and just for, to find out that people actually cared about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And I think one of the other things that we found that um, the workers fatigue that has um, eventuated during the process and still is now very obvious with high numbers of people not coming to work has been one of the great um, problems that we have to deal with. But I'd also be interested, Jared, from your perspective, of COVID, because I know you were very involved with, with how we were dealing with it. And also some of your comments about the Royal Commission, particularly relating to the government's response to it and, and how you think that we're going with that. Yeah, thanks for that, Carol. I, I agree with um, a lot there that um, the session said. I think when we look back last year, and I, I was asked by the, the two ministers, the Federal Minister Colbeck and our State Minister Luke Donnellan, to play a, a very active role with the families in the most critically affected centres. So I had a lot to do with families at Epping Gardens and, and other areas like that, St Basil's, where there was um, the, all the tragedies that <coughs> sessions referred to. Um, I think it, the creation of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre was the turning point. Um, I think without that, we just struggled to mobilise the resources that were required. So I think the learnings that came out of that were particularly important, not only for Victoria, but on the national stage, that it needs a whole coordination effort when you get an outbreak of that quantity and that significance. The other is the ongoing issue I totally agree with, which is the communication one. It's the issue that that um, I get involved with. Every time there's an outbreak, we see that aged care services move into some sort of lockdown from visitors. And what happens is that once that moves beyond a few days, then it creates those alarm bells that that session talked about. Families aren't there. The, so many families, as we know, aren't just visitors. They're essential to the care and well-being of older people. And I think that's the real tension. Uh, and I absolutely know it in my discussions with public health. That on the one hand, absolutely nobody wants to see a repeat of last year. And there has to be a conservative approach that's taken at the moment and everybody understands that. But on the other hand, the challenge is how we give enough access to families that are central to the well-being, you know, um, that somebody with dementia isn't going to eat their food or settle in the same way if they're not having that regular visit. So I think that the communication with families um, and with residents remains number one. 
as as we move into aged care um, lockdowns again in the future. <clears throat> I think the other I totally agree in, in terms of staff. Uh, as I you know as I dealt with um, you know from the families with those tragedies last year. I was just in awe of the staff that in the middle of all that kept turning up every day and knowing full well that the families weren't able to, to be there and still now, it's the staff that fill that void. And so, yeah, absolutely in awe of, of their commitment and, and my you know, shout out to, to them and to, to the role of GPs and health professionals. I think that um, the the big issue going forward, Carol, that, that I hear from families is that there, you know, for a number of older people that did survive that had COVID in some way, or even not not necessarily having COVID, there's been a bit of a permanent decline in their well-being. And I know every time that there is a, a need to, to lock down a facility, that's the very first thing that happens as families immediately start to be worried about, you know, what's the sort of permanent decline that's going to occur to the well-being of, you know, of my loved one. And I think that's where a lot of attention in the communication can improve. I think um, many aged care providers have done exceptionally well. And I just saw some fantastic innovation in the amount of effort that they put in last year. Um, and you know, I know this is the fatigue issue is every time we get to that point, getting back to that mindset. And I know it's very difficult, but aged care providers, and I'm not sure whether everybody is aware of this, but they typically deal with one nominated representative from the family. And then it relies on the families to then communicate and pass that information on more widely. And of course, that system doesn't always work exceptionally well. So I, I think the communication issue is central, but beneath it, it's the real question about the well-being of, of older people that's on the mind so much of families when we get to that point. In terms of the Aged Care Royal Commission, I think there's a couple of things um, that, that are most significant. I chair an advisory group for, for the Victorian government. And I know some of the feedback that's come through very heavily is that the absolute desire that the, the rights of older people are the centrepiece of reform. And so the review and the reform of the Aged Care Act becomes the centrepiece for older people. What becomes their rights? What becomes their entitlements? Uh, I think there was a sense of disappointment that we haven't moved to what older people would call an entitlement based system. And so that in NDIS, for example, as a contrast, if you have an assessed need, then you can have that need met within a timely manner. We still aren't, even with the uh, announcement that there'll be 80,000 more home care packages announced over time, and that's an enormously significant step in terms of the waiting list, we aren't going to move to an entitlement-based system. And so over time, that issue is still gonna bubble as a, as a most significant issue in the background. And I think the third really <coughs> high, highly significant issue for us is what I'd call the crisis of confidence in residential aged care. We've all seen the Four, Four Corners programs and the other exposés and the Royal Commission, uh, the fact that they labelled their first report with the name of that report was neglect. I think what's happened, and none of us want to see any of those failures, and every one of them was a tragedy. But what's happened, I think, in the average person's mind is that pendulum has gone too far that that sense of balance of acknowledging the amazement, commitment and dedication of frontline staff, the dedication of so many people to provide the best quality care, that balance has been lost in, in the way that the media in particular has portrayed. And, you know, it's, it's tragic, but we, you know, we have over 200,000 people living in residential aged care. And uh, sad to say, there will always be some failures. It's just inevitable, you know, the nature of a human services system. So I think that crisis of confidence is most, most important because if what happens, Carol, is that older people start to deny um, residential aged care as a really important option for them and their well-being, they're going to be far worse off living isolated in their own home without the necessary access to family supports and other health systems. So there's absolutely a critical role for residential aged care and rebuilding confidence in the public mind in that is the third most significant issue that's come up at the advisory group. Yes, and I would agree with that. And I think most importantly, what we found is that people are very scared. They're very apprehensive, but usually after 
a couple of weeks and, and or maybe a month in aged care, they settle down and they actually start enjoying life. We have people coming in who come from very isolated um, environments. Their partner has died or then unable, they've come out of a hospital because of, a, of, a, of an incident that they've had. And once they settle in and make some friends, start going down to enjoying the meals, that their whole life does change. And it's really disappointing that from a, from a, a general perspective, we don't see that, um, that view of what people think about aged care. And, and it's, it's important from an from a employer's perspective that our, our main focus is on how do we care, not in just the medical sense, but in the, the whole the whole person sense, looking at their well-being, looking at how they are communicating with families, and looking at how we can keep them active and engaged and in enjoying life. I used to tell my staff of over 2,000 people in Blue Cross that the most important thing is that everybody that we care for wants to get up in the morning. They want to go down to breakfast. They, they're looking forward to their day. And if we can work on that, I think we will also be making a significant change. But Sashin, if we could just talk about this a collaborative care model that, that we've been mentioning in this session and in the last session, um, we, it would be interesting to see, to get your perspective. Jared, I know you need to leave. Um, so when you, when you need to go, can you just, disappear out of the screen and and session and I will continue and take some questions afterwards so thank you for for joining and giving us your very valuable and, and insightful information about what is happening in the community in aged care so thanks Jared Thanks very much, Carol. Yeah, unfortunately, I do have another commitment to attend to. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come along to, today and <clears throat> good luck with the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Jared. Um, so yeah, so, you. Thank you. Um, so I think with uh, creating a collaborative model, I think that the first step is to move away from silos. Um, so traditionally, um, you know, there's still quite a lot of... Um, say from the, we'll talk first about the, the medical care and then there's all the other care that you were just talking about. It's, you know, physical, psychological and social well-being. It's the definition of health. Um, from uh, the general practice point of view, the primary care point of view, I think it's really important we move away from siloed clinicians who are, you know, working um, alone um, because the complexity uh, and the um, uh, scrutiny and um, uh, the work involved and the, the various sort of administrative burdens on a practitioner are quite significant now. And, um, and the rate at which technology and, and other um, factors around us are changing means that someone who's working alone and in a silo is, is you know, probably more at risk as a clinician. Um, and because uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed in working in aged care without the right support structure, um, uh, they may not interact and collaborate as well as can be achieved because they're so inundated and overwhelmed with their normal day-to-day -day work. So I think the first part is, is moving away from the silo. I think um, one of the key recommendations in the, in the Royal Commission was around dedicated specialised medical practices for aged care. You know, I'm, um, obviously I'm biased because that's what we do, but um, I, I think that is important to recognise, you know, just under 1% of, of the population um, ha, lives in aged care and that um, group of the population have very different care needs to the other 99 percent and the workflows and the other structures that support the care for those people um, uh, the residents in aged care is quite different to traditional general practice and it's great that that's been recognized um, I think it's really important that there is facilitation of um, team working between between the groups so um, you know, medical care, allied health, specialised care, you know, and another of the Royal Commission recommendations is that everyone has a geriatric um, assessment every year, pretty much, um, in consultation with the GP. And so, um, you know, all of that working in concert with the allied health, the lifestyle programmes, um, 
the mental health side, I think that's really important. Um, I don't think any of us needed a Royal Commission to know that residents of aged care should have proper access to mental health care. Um, but that's, you know, that's, you could have just asked 20 uh, or 30 people in a straw poll, and everyone would have said that. Um, I think, you know, all of those pieces working together is really important. And, and I think there needs to be some funding around um, uh, some coordination of that. So I'm, I'm, you know, at the moment, there's no sole accountability point for that coordination. Yes, facilities are in the middle, but I'm not sure there's actual funding for dedicated coordination. In my estimation, the demands on facilities are so high now that um, it may not be the best place for that accountability to sit. Coordination is generally really well done by primary care. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big advocate that, that the primary care should be involved in taking a, a lead role in that. And I think, um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of referral to the Netherlands and their system where there are dedicated um, aged care physicians who, who work in, in um, residential facilities. They've got a quite socialized model of healthcare there, which is quite different to what we have here. So um, I like, and someone mentioned in the chat earlier, just the separation and independence of the medical side from the care side, I think that's quite good. It's just healthy to have diversity and, and um, not have all of that um, uh, being um, managed by just one, one group. I think, I think that, that is quite good, a good tension to have because people are looking at things through different lenses. Um, but the administrative burdens that are on, as um, uh, Dr. Marzouk's put in the, in the chat, you know, the administrative burdens one of the unintended consequences of what's happened is that um, uh, it's increased with the Royal Commission, the administrative burdens upon, upon um, um, some facilities. Um, the intention was to, you know, for example, with psychotropics, to reduce psychotropic drug use. So then, uh, you know, it was, it was mandated that there are regular psychotropic drug reviews. So now the focus is on the wrong activity. Have we done the review? That's not going to change what we want to happen. The thing that's going to change what we want to happen is are we spending enough time doing the activities to help with um, uh, behavioral symptoms of, of dementia? But the focus isn't on that, it's are we doing the psychotropic reviews? So there's all these unintended consequences that happen. Um, uh, but I think the key is going to be a coordination role and that I think should sit with dedicated general practice that is focused on aged care. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, and uh, it will be interesting to see if, if people have got questions around that area. Um, and, and yes, I think we, we have to keep in mind that the, the medical care and, and the, the continued supervision is really important. From my perspective, it is, is how, do we, how do we care for the whole person? How do we make sure that, and, and again, impacts on the Royal Commission is documentation and reporting and keeping being able to validate everything that you do. And we have so much um, time that is taken up in that, that administrative role of writing down every single thing that you do. And the important thing is for the staff to actually have the time to be with the residents, to engage with them, to keep them engaged and, and doing things and to keep them active. And, and I think one of the big impacts of, the, of, of COVID was the isolation and people having to stay in their rooms. And that had an enormous impact on people's mental health and on, on the, the mental health of all the staff as well, on how they, um, they, couldn't, they couldn't actually do the job that they, they were there for. One of our other big issues at the moment is, is the staffing levels. And to be able to, to provide this really good model of care, you actually need the staff. And that's been in, impacted again by COVID because we don't have the, the number of carers available to us. We have a large portion of, of um, people coming from other countries, a lot of a lot of um, trainee nurses that were training here were working in aged care while they were doing their their, their training. They are not available anymore, 
and and the focus that we we need to is how do we get the right people in aged care and we get people working there who actually want to be there and they're not doing it because it's the only job that they can they can get um, one of the other things is is that that working with the gps and working with the, the clinical nurses and the relationship between the nurses and the doctors working together and, and having the time to actually have this time to strategize and work out what is best for that resident. And um, so that uh, just an example of, of one of the things that, uh, one of the incidents that we were involved with was a 102 year old woman who decided that she'd had enough and wanted to commit suicide. And, and, um, and when she, she attempted it, um, the response was to put her on, on drugs and to, to, to tranquilize her. And, and how, you know, she, she was tired. She was at the end of her life and she wanted, she wanted something to, to, to help her get through this thing. And our response was, was not the one that we, you know, we needed to do to, to get her through it. So it's a complex situation. We, Aged care is not an easy job, but it's it's a very satisfying job. I loved working in the sector, and and I think um, we don't want to lose that. So it's how how we all work collaboratively together, and as you said, with allied health, with with families, so important to have the families engaged, and to also have the, the care that we can provide and and actually demonstrate. So. Um, the other question or the last area that we you might like to co comment on is the uncertainty around vaccinations and people saying, should I, shouldn't I? Um, from your perspective, would you like to just make some comments on that? Yeah. Um, uh, so um, uh, the rollout excluded GPs. So I'll just say that up, straight up front, like complete stupidity to exclude GPs. Um, uh, and GPs would have had the residents done months before these private providers who are paid, you know, astronomical sums to get it done, would have done it cheaper, faster and better. However, uh, that's all the water under the bridge. The other thing that people on the shop floor were saying is that there was huge vaccine hesitancy amongst um, people who work in aged care. And I don't think that was ever incorporated into the planning or the strategizing or the messaging. And so this is a failure around the whole messaging. We've seen this week how um, messaging can go wrong when you've got uh, non-expert people, uh, even if they are the leader of the country, um, uh, sort of putting their fingers in there. Um, I think the reality is we've just got to go on evidence. So I talked earlier about Kirkland Life Care, where 120 residents last February in 2020, um, 120 residents got it and, thir and 39 perished. In Kentucky in March 2021, in a facility that was majority vaccinated, um, 24 residents and 20 staff got COVID. Of the 24 residents, uh, and it came through a staff member um, uh, who was unvaccinated, that's where the outbreak started, and uh, 24 of the residents who, who got COVID, um, 18 of those were vaccinated. And of those 18, one perished. Of the six that were not vaccinated, um, uh, two perished. Um, and the staff were all safe. Um, uh, the, I didn't have data about who, who got it, but it didn't spread at the same, to the same extent as the Kirkland Life Care example. So I think we've got to talk to evidence and explain that to, to the people, but it's not, it's not a fast process. Um, <laughs> You know, getting that messaging right, and we've had plenty of time to get that messaging right, but we're now trying to play catch up and confusing people. Um, yes, thank you for that. And um, I think we're coming to the end of our session. So, if there are any questions that people have for Sashin or for for me, um, we're happy to take those now. Otherwise, um, there's one about technology. So, about collaborative care and technology. Um, George uh, Margellis. Um, uh, absolutely, there's a role for technology. Um, the reality is, not until the Aged Care Commission was there a recommendation that everyone is 
has a digital patient management system um, and a residence management system. So it's only from the last the Royal Commission recommendations that, that you know, they've recommended um, by some time in 22 that everywhere has that. And by the end of this year, there are electronic medication management systems. So um, we have to remember where we're starting. We've got such a variety and um, uh, such a gap between uh, what's happening in some places compared to others um, around the technology that's there. The other thing we have to remember is technology is a tool. It doesn't substitute care. So, you know, I loved, Carol, what you just said about, you know, my, my measure for everyone was, um, uh, you know, do, do, all, do all our residents want to get out of bed? That is a great measure because that's focusing on the right thing. You're focused on, on exactly the right thing. You know, are we caring for that person? So technology is a tool, but the complexity around technology at the moment is that there are so many different platforms that you risk getting platform fatigue in that uh, in one facility, there's platform X, in another facility, there's platform Y, and then the doctor or the physio or um, you know, the dietitian they use another platform and none of them talk to each other. So maybe where we need to legislate is that anyone who's involved in this technology needs to have open slather for integration um, uh, with the right permissions in place. Or whether we develop something like My Health Record on that. Yes, and, and I, think that, I think that's a very, very important point because yes, everybody has a different system and everybody's trained in different ways. So. If we could get that out of the Royal Commission and, and some funding to, to do that would be a, a great achievement. Um, the, the other question is, is how do we increase collaboration between the medical staff and, and, the, and the care staff? And um, that is an issue. And um, I, I, for me, <laughs> the, the solution is more time, but we, where do we get that time from? And, and everybody is so busy and so, um, focused on what they have to do and the amount of time they have to spend on it, that it makes it makes it very difficult for that general talking and communicating with people. Um, I think we'll end up. If you've got a comment on that, we'll yeah, end up. That absolutely. We'll um, we'll leave the session then. But thank you very much for your contribution. Mm -hmm. It's really been very productive. No um, I'll finish with that with a comment on that, which is. Um, I 100 percent agree it's all about time so time is our most precious resource and it is a resource and it needs to be funded to allow this to happen but the reality is uh, it's an investment so if we front end the investment to make sure that time is resourced appropriately i have no doubt but we can obviously do the right research to back it up i have no doubt that we'll get better outcomes in terms of uh, you know more more alignment with people's wishes and um uh, their advanced care directives and plans, more alignment with that, less hospital admission um, uh, and less unnecessary admission in cases where they could have been you know, avoided with the right time investment early. So I think it's all about uh, short term versus medium to long term thinking. If we're thinking medium to long term, we'd resource appropriately at the front end. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for, for this session. So I think we'll leave it there. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. I uh, hope everybody enjoys their day. Thank you. Yes, thank you.